You are Locked On Ole Miss, your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Run right along here, Locked On SEC, covering your team every day. And join us now is our buddy Stephen Willis, host of the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. Stephen, it is uh, very interesting. What a difference a week makes. We're sitting here. A week ago saying, my God, look at all these SEC teams that, uh, you know, are all going to finish 10 and 2. And it's going to be, a, you know, who some teams don't even want to go to the SEC championship. Let them go fight it out. And all of us at 10 and 2, we'll be sitting here waiting for our bid. And lo and behold, Texas A&M, Alabama and Ole Miss all take a third loss this past week. And man, the Ole Miss Rebels, for all the expectations of the offseason, feeling like this was the year, the number one portal class and Lane Kiffin bringing back Jackson Dart and all these different pieces Where's the fan base right now? A lot of people with expectations just a week ago. Hey, we win these last two and we're in. Disappointed, I think it'd probably be the correct word. Now, it isn't completely over yet. There's still a Lloyd Christmas dumb and dumber. So you're telling me there's a chance type issue. So it's not completely shut the door, but it's not likely that Ole Miss is going to make the playoffs. So there's disappointment. And once it is final, I think the fan base is going to have to do an autopsy of what happened this season. It was weird. Consistency was a problem for Ole Miss this whole season. Through the Kentucky game, the LSU game, the Florida game, they were basically all three the same football game, by the way. It, it, each of the problems from those games got carried over, which means consistency was a problem. And was it the spring practice, the kinder, gentler fall camp, the fear of a depth chart, there's going to be plenty of time for autopsies if and when this goes down. But right now, I'd have to say cautiously disappointed is where the Ole Miss fan base is. I said, I made this take. You just give me your thoughts on, on it. I, I think, look, all the talk of Quinshawn Judkins and he was a problem here and he didn't want to be here and he wanted NIL, all that kind of stuff. Throw all that out the window. If they give him what he wanted, they resolve whatever behind-the-scenes issues they were. If Quinshawn Judkins is in an Ole Miss uniform this year, Ole Miss is at, at minimum 10-2. and two. That's my argument. I just feel like – and Henry Parrish did his best to give you good you know, running uh, moments, but to me, Quinshawn was so special. If he were on this team, I feel like this is a playoff team right now. And I think that Ole Miss bungled the running back position so much this season – I think you're probably right that if Quinshawn's on this team, they're 10 and 2 and in the playoffs. But if Ole Miss had a, I don't know, a set running back rotation, they're probably 10 and 2 and in the playoffs. The only running back that rushed for 100 yards all season for Ole Miss is Ulysses Bentley. Ulysses Bentley hasn't played at all. He played a little bit in that LSU game, had 100 yards rushing. And all of a sudden, you think he's going to play against Florida. It was going to be his time to shine. No, Ole Miss just moved over like the wide receiver five into the running back position, say, here. And Bentley didn't get a carry on the day. Nobody knows what's going on. They repeatedly asked Kiffin about what's going on. And Kiffin just says coaches have to make tough choices and they haven't done anything wrong or anything like that. And it just it doesn't add up, Chris. It genuinely doesn't add up. Now, I will say this. People might be frustrated with Lane. People are not upset with Lane. It isn't a situation to where they're questioning the head coaching position at Ole Miss. I think they're just gotten to the point, Lane's getting ready to finish his fifth year at Ole Miss or something like that, that they're comfortable of knowing what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong, and they feel safe critiquing him of what's going on. And especially now that players are getting paid, through NIL and stuff like that, you're starting to see the fan base react a little bit differently to a college football team when things go wrong. Yeah, it is it is fascinating, that running back thing you mentioned, because I remember, you know, they they bring in, you know, Rashad Amos from, what, Miami of Ohio. They bring in, a, you know, a couple guys. I, you know, and it was like Henry Parrish coming back from Miami. You're like, oh, okay, whatever. But they had this Matt Jones kid, and, you know, it's like, but they just never could really get it figured out. I know they asked Lane about, uh, Ulysses Bentley, all he kind of pointed to was yards per carry, which, you know, I think Bentley's averaging 4.3 yards per carry. Henry Parrish averaging 5.2. Um, I don't know. There was nothing like that really jumps out on, oh, we can't give this kid a carry. You know, like it, it just is very strange. And, you know, Logan Diggs, I know the LSU transfer was getting healthy and, you know, maybe we'll see him eventually, but it just, yeah, I don't know, man. That whole thing just seems really mangled. And to your point, like, if they when who was the kid? They tried to get some kid who was going to transfer, and then the grades weren't going to 
work or something. So oh, Deion Smith, the wide receiver. Well, there was Deion Smith, but I yeah. think there was another running. Oh back. yeah, the one that went to Arizona, the Mary. Yeah, yeah, kid. yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there's just you're right. Like, it's the minute they figured we're going to move on from Ulysses Bentley, they should have immediately, or, or, or rather, um, uh, Quinchon, they should have immediately said, "Let's go get a, you know, bell cow running back from wherever, and let's make this happen." Yeah, and then when Henry Parrish got injured, who knew that he was the the driving force on this team offensively at running back because after he went down, it just got weird. Even though Bentley had a touchdown against the Georgia Bulldogs, he had a couple receptions that were really big in that game. Bentley played well against Georgia, didn't play at all against Florida, and they asked Kiffin about it, and Kiffin said in that game why Micah Davis played running back. is like, eh, we just wanted to try something different. Yeah, and by the way, Parrish, even with the injury, is still eighth in the SEC in total rushing yards. So, you know, there's a chance he finishes top 10 when it's all said and done. Um, talk about the loss to Florida. Who do you put the blame on? I, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, there's blame enough to go all around. Jackson Dart has a couple chances late in the game to, to you know, clutch moment, do what he does, and he didn't come through, throws two interceptions. I think play calling was an issue. I thought defense had their issue. I mean, to me, there's enough blame to go all around. I think the blame firmly rests at Lane's feet right now on that game. There was an early fourth and one in that game. You're on the road. Ole Miss decides to go for it. They ran a quarterback, uh, ran J.J. Pegues off tackle with Jackson Dart as a lead blocker. That makes no sense under any circumstance. Take the points. You are the favorite playing on the road. It should be okay if you have points. If you're playing with the lead, that is good. And there is no bigger momentum boost in football than a fourth down stop. Florida went down and scored a touchdown. That was a 10-point swing. That was the ball game at that point. And a couple other times it got weird um, with Ole Miss. But, you know, Jackson Dart had three possessions at the end of the game that he went three and out, threw an interception, and threw an interception. He he did not have the end of that statue-level game to get Ole Miss into the playoffs. That that didn't happen, but it wasn't Jackson Dart's fault in this game. Jackson but, Dart actually started off pretty well. Yeah, and and it, it felt like, okay, here comes that moment where Ole Miss pulls away, and it just, like, it just never got there. Um, and look, give some credit to Florida, right? I mean, this is a team that still has talented players. It still has pretty good coaches that – we're facing an impossible schedule this year, and everybody looked at that schedule at the end of the year and went, oh, they're going to lose out. They're going to lose to LSU, Ole Miss, and Florida State. And it turns out they win the LSU game, they win the Florida State game, or Ole Miss game, and now a chance to beat Florida State to get the seven wins. Who the hell had Florida at seven wins this year based on that schedule? So you got to give yeah. Billy Napier some, some credit there. Um, when we look at this week, the Egg Bowl, obviously Ole Miss heavy favorites against Mississippi State, but – a guy that Lane knows pretty well in Jeff Lebby and Mississippi State, for as bad as the defense has been, the offense has been good at times. Michael Van Buren has looked not like a true freshman playing quarterback. So give me a quick thought on this uh, Egg Bowl. I got to think Lane's going to want to go out there and I, I think even though he's buddies with Lebby, like run the score up, make this look convincing because if it does come down to a tiebreaker between three lost teams, you want to send a message Ole Miss ended strong. Yeah, especially with them being the first game of the weekend. So nothing has happened. Nothing's going to be taken away. Ole Miss has that opportunity. I think Ole Miss is going to try and score 50 points in this game. No, they are. Now, I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying it's going to work out. We've seen that Ole Miss offense struggle at times this year. But the thing that concerns me that I think about is Jeff Lebby against Pete Golding in the 2020 football game. It's that crazy game that was like 63 to 52. And Alabama just – they got every yard except for seven in that game. But Ole Miss was able to drive up and down the field on that Pete Golding, Nick Saban defense, and it frustrated Nick Saban to no end. The next year, Golding got a little bit better with it, but that game gives me a little bit pause, and I wonder if Jeff Levy is going to be able to move the ball a little bit, which if that happens, and let's say Ole Miss scores a bunch of points in that game, that could be a hard cover for the Rebels because I think it's 27 and a half now. Uh, so you you don't think any chance Mississippi State makes this a ball game, rivalry game, sometimes weird things happen, you think Ole Miss wins going away? I don't prescribe to the theory that throw the record books out when these two teams play. I think that's a narrative that's started by the underdog to make the game a little bit more even if you, you know, make that self-fulfilling prophecy. But I do think that State's going to come out and play harder than they have against anybody else all year. If Ole Miss 
repeats what they did against Florida. They do not play clean, and this gives us a chance to get into a ball game in the second and third quarter. And then from there, I don't know if State has the defense to match up. I know that State's defense has trouble stopping the run. Ole Miss has trouble running the ball, so it becomes a secondary type thing. I think Ole Miss should be able to score points and and do what they need to do, but it does worry me about that Jeff Levy, Pete Golding dynamic from 2020. Yeah, three and three uh, in the last six games in this rivalry. So, um, you know, you can skew it how, however you want. Um, just as long as nobody fakes peeing on a fire hydrant, right? Yes, yes. I mean, of course, that's how Ole Miss got Lane Kiffin to begin with. <laughs> Still one of the, <laughs> the most and, and by the way, Ole Miss is going for four out of five in this rivalry, too. Okay. You mentioned three out of six, but it'd, it'd be four out of five of Ole Miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was saying. However you want to, you can mm. you could skew the numbers out however you want. Oh, uh, of course. All right. A couple things, Stephen, looking ahead. Uh, what is this offseason like? If Lane wins this, they don't make the they don't make the playoff and they're going, I don't know, cheese it bowl or whatever. Like what 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 is this offseason like? Because the Ole Miss fan base still, hey, Lane's our guy. You know, we want him here long term, all that. And where's Lane? Does he get the wandering eye again? Is he locked in? I know he said some things about, oh, I love the state of Mississippi. You don't know until you live here and all that kind of stuff. So he's saying all the right things. But where's the fan base and where's Lane this offseason? Oh, the fan base, Lane's here for as long as, long as he wants to be here. And I think Lane wants to be here. And there's not many places that Lane can go. I mean, there's not many jobs that I wouldn't look at um, that, that, that as it goes on. And like if Florida next year, it looks like Billy Napier is going to be fine. The job to look at in the future would be Miami. Miami, Mario Cristobal is not going anywhere. You know, I think both of them are kind of stuck with each other for better in this situation. And the Ole Miss fan base is going to show up for the transfer portal. Lane's going to attack the portal this offseason. And you'll see players get brought in and try and retool that defense and create the defensive side of the ball that Ole Miss had this year as well as setting Austin Simmons up for the most success that he can have since he's going to be the kind of the future of this position in 2025. Caleb Cunningham, maybe even there's rumors about Deion Smith, you know, just look at that. And then um, um, Caden Lee as well. So this wide receiver unit with Wade Aiden Williams and everything could be pretty good. And Logan Diggs should be healthy by next season as well. And Ole Miss is bringing in Shakai Mills Knight. So skill position wise on offense, I guess it would surprise nobody that Ole Miss should be pretty good. Yeah, and and uh, they finally Trey Harris finally runs out of eligibility. Jackson yeah. Dart runs out of eligibility. So those guys are will be moving on. Uh, it is an interesting dynamic though, because I'd heard some rumbling. Somebody told me uh, last week that they had heard that Walker Howard was probably going to transfer back to the state of Louisiana and maybe go play at Louisiana Lafayette or something like that. And that maybe explains why Austin Simmons was the backup. Uh, in moments this year, and it seems like the Austin, freshman, Austin just beat him out. Yeah, so you you yeah. feel Austin Simmons is the guy next year? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Austin is um to a talk of a low with um, four more inches. It is that he is really good? You saw one series against Georgia. He taking them straight down the field and scoring a touchdown. I have no problems with Austin Simmons being the quarterback next year. Hopefully, uh, no concussion issues like Tua. Yes, definitely not. We need we need to not we not need to not running. Yeah, that that will be uh that will be the safe way to go. Give me a quick thought though, Stephen. On um, you know, as we sit here and a lot of three loss teams, how many teams SEC teams get into the playoff? In your opinion, sitting here right now, I think Texas is in. I think um Tennessee's in if they beat Vandy. Tennessee is not in if they lose to Vandy. Um, Georgia's in. So Texas and Georgia's in. Texas A and M. If they beat Texas, could go to the championship game and kind of backdoor their way in with an SEC championship win. And then there's that fourth SEC team that right now is Alabama sitting in the catbird seat. Um, A&M is going to be there as well. It depends on the game that they have against Texas. Ole Miss is sitting right there, and Carolina is there as well. But, of course, you know, if you put one to another, that 20, 27-3 victory that Ole Miss had in that game, that's going to be since it's apples to apples. But I think those are the main competitors. But right now, I would have to say probably Alabama is going to find their way in. Yeah. Well, look, if AM loses to Texas, that's their fourth loss. They're mm-hmm. out. Um, if AM wins, AM goes to Atlanta to play Georgia. You think Texas is probably still in as a 10 and 2 at large? Mm-hmm. 
But then, you know, if A&M were to beat Georgia, they would get, you know, the, the first round mm-hmm. by most likely they would, you know, be the SEC champ. And then is Georgia in still, cause that would be their third loss. They would be, you know, 10 and three. So there's a lot, a lot of weird stuff that can still happen. Yeah. This, I, this is absolutely nuts. This, this whole SEC season is, is one for the ages. Honestly, it's, it, it's reminiscent. What is that? That 2008 or 2006 season. What was the year that LSU won the national title? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, 07, and then the game yeah. was played to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those weird years at the end of the year is kind of trending that direction. Last thing I did want to mention to you, though, I, I've seen so many people crapping on the SEC here the last couple of days and saying, oh, the big bad SEC and all this. Uh, aren't they proving the point, though, Stephen? Like, if everybody, anybody could beat anybody on any given day, doesn't that mean your conference is awesome and not, like, we have three good teams undefeated and that's it? Like, to me... That speaks to the conference. It's a badass conference that, you know, outside of Mississippi State this year, really anybody could beat anybody in any given week. Yeah, I think college football fans, they crave that elite team that's sitting up undefeated and doing all that and just rolling over. Think of the 2011 SEC slate where um, LSU and Bama was just rolling through the whole conference. Um, I think they're programmed to like those and whatever. So when they're not there, what's wrong? And the problem is with the NIL and the transfer portal and stuff like that, there's less elite teams out there, which means the lower teams are a little bit better. The top teams are a little bit worse. And what you're seeing is the closest thing to parity that you can have in college football, and that's going on right now in the SEC. Kentucky, the number 15 team, beat Ole Miss. Oklahoma, the number 14 team, just boat raced Alabama. I mean, anything can happen in this league. Yeah, I, somebody, uh, what, what was it? Somebody brought up that the, the best teams in the Big Ten currently, um, let me pull this up. It's Oregon, Ohio State, Indiana, and Penn State. They are all sitting up there at the top, yet all the teams they've played are, like, all terrible. Like, in other words, that no, none of those teams are beating top 25 teams. They're all just kind of sitting there taking so their Texas. L's. Yeah, I mean it's it's all just it's all mediocrity. So it's like, okay, Big Ten is top heavy. You've got Oregon, Ohio State, Indiana, Penn State, and they're great, but like that's top heavy. That means everybody else sucks. Like from Iowa on down to Purdue, like y'all are all just trash. Whereas the SEC, again, in the SEC, the Purdue's are beating the Ohio States. And you know, anyway, I just think that that speaks to more the SEC oh, strength yeah. as opposed to oh, your conference sucks. Why? Because everybody's beating everybody. Doesn't that mean maybe. The conference is really good because everybody's beating everybody. But anyway, I digress. You know, you know what, Chris? What it is is this year the SEC is exactly what SEC fans have said the SEC was for the last twenty. Yeah, well, and I keep telling yeah. people stop, stop inviting Oklahoma and Texas, like <laughs> bring in a Wake Forest and a and a Virginia, like that would even things. You know, but you bring I, want, in- I, I, I wanted Georgia Tech and Tulane. Hey, man, I, I'd oh. welcome that. Then all this crap of people were talking, oh, let's get Clemson and Florida State. No, we don't want any more <laughs> big programs. We want, like, because then like six and six is the bar at that point, like, because you're just playing behemoths every single week. It's just, it's it's rough. All right, he is Stephen Willis, host of Locked On Ole Miss. Uh, thank you guys for making us your first listen every day. For your second listen, check out Stephen with Locked On Ole Miss. Let everybody know what you got on the podcast this week. Um, we are going through Mississippi State prep. We have a crossover with Jake Wimberly on Wednesday, I believe. And we have the squad show as well. We're going to talk to Michael Cass from the Northeast Mississippi Tupelo Daily Journal. We're going to tell you why Ole Miss wins this game. And then Friday, it's all game day stuff. So tune in. You can follow me at the Stephen Willis and check me out at Locked On Ole Miss on YouTube. I love it. Bring it back to Thanksgiving night, please. I, I, look, it's Memphis too late on Thanksgiving night. I, no offense to those guys. I would rather watch the Egg Bowl on Thanksgiving with a cocktail. I, me too. I'm with you there. The, the game belongs on Thanksgiving. I, fans don't like it on Thanksgiving because right. it messes with their holiday, but it's fitting for people that enjoy the game on TV to have a nice little bookender of the day. Yeah, come on. I've tailgated in Starkville and Oxford. You can you can bring the turkey to the tailgate. We can make this happen. Steven, thanks for the time, man. We'll talk to you again real soon, all right? All right, appreciate it, buddy.